is going to overseas to do a surgery. Please pray for her. Um, it's an urgent surgery. It, it wasn't meant to be, but, but I know God is, is still will be with her and guide the surgeon hands to operate on her. And um, before we start, we're gonna sh I'm going to invite you all to stand and we're going to sing on top of our, our lungs that we say, shout to the Lord, because we know that God needs our praise and worship, that God is our Redeemer, God is our Savior, and we need to sing, to shout for Him, shout the joy for Him. Shout to the Lord, and I invite you all to sing with all your heart. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is God like you all of my day. I want to pray the wonders of the
As you stay in your place, we will ask you to have a silent prayer together with us uh, before we start. Good morning, church. So my girls are a little bit nervous and they're whispering to me, I'm so nervous. <laughs> so um, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. I would like to wish a very warm welcome to all the adults this morning. And welcome to the youth too. And the children. And, and the babies. <laughs> we rehearsed before we come. So, um, very, very warm welcome to everyone this morning, to all church members, and you forgot some people. Welcome to the visitors. So, um, this morning, Theo came to me and gave me a list of, I think, two or three visitors. And then he kept coming to me two or three times and said to me, we have more. <laughs> so I would like to wish a very warm welcome to all the visitors today. I know you're numerous this morning. I was going to put you on the spot and ask you to stand up, but I don't think, Jeremy, you're not a visitor. <laughs> so if you are a visitor this morning and it's your first time at church, I hope that you have a friend in, um, you know, the attendance. If you don't, raise um, church members. I would ask you to raise your hands if you want to make new friends this morning. So if you don't have any friends and you don't know anyone, look at all the people who raised their hands. You can go and speak to them after church. Thank you. And now Madison has a little poem to read. God gave us a church up on a hill where thy word is heard and hearts are made still, where the sound of praise fills the countryside, where the gospel of Christ is pro proclaimed far and wide, where souls hungering for Jesus find rest in him, 
where the grace of God is transforming men. Happy Sabbath. morning church uh, I hope you're having a blessed time as I am uh, we have a, a few announcements a first announcement we we want to pass our condolences to Corinne and family uh, she lost her auntie during this week I uh, was sad to hear the news because I for a time, she, she was coming to my place for prayer meeting. So we were blessed to, to know her. And yeah, so we, we are all heart with you. And we are praying for your family. A next announcement. I have lost my phone. I don't know where I put it. <laughs> and there's no announcement there. So, OK, I'll keep on going. So we have, yeah, thank you, Pastor. Ah, it's here. It's here. All right. Working B. Working bee at Rebound Court. I know a lot of you have been um, itching, wanted to help, but for different reasons, because of white card, yellow card, red card, whatever, can't make it there. But we are going to have a, a working bee next Sunday. So, as it is said there, there are some pews that need to be dismantled. So if you have a, a screwdriver, that's a manual one, the one with um, the batteries one, so you bring them along and you can contact Alebinet who is looking after this working bee. And I hope to see a lot of you there to, to get these pews down. Uh, if you don't have a, a, the screwdriver, the electric one, don't worry, just show up. We'll, we'll find something for you that you can help to, to dismantle the things. Uh, Next one, bumper bar stickers. I don't know what this is. So I will call John. John, yes, John, John will help us with that. Hello, brothers and sisters. Actually, um, I should have been a bit better prepared, but I've forgotten I was going to tell you about this this morning. But some of you, are, for quite a few of you must have um, picked up these stickers from the table that was out in the foyer over the last few weeks. There's none left. But I'm, I'm thinking one or two of you may not really be aware what to use them for. And I, I said to the ladies out there before, um, you know, make sure that they, people know what they're for, that they're not going to stick them on the fridges. Uh, it's just a way of outreach. Um, um, I don't know if you remember, you know, years ago, stickers would be put on the on the bumper bar, honk if you know, if you love Jesus or something like that, or Jesus is my Lord. Um, so. Look at that. It must be one of the last ones left. This is one of two de designs, and it says... His mind in you, the hope of glory. Um, can anyone guess? It's actually a combination of two Bible texts. Uh, one's from Colossians. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the other one, I'm not too sure where the other one is, but it's sort of let this mind also be in you, which is in Jesus, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And it goes on. I think it's one of uh, another one of Paul's writings, letters. So that's one of them. And there's another one too. And I just want to <clears throat> just highlight the artwork <clears throat> that's gone into this. Two of our young people that have been given this, this gift um, <clears throat> of being able to produce nice artwork, I asked one of them, I said, look, would you like me to mention your name? He said, no, 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 there's plenty of young people that also have um, good artistic ability and we need to 
to encourage that in our young people. And I was just encouraged actually this morning during Sabbath school when uh, Andrea was talking about the choir. And it, it, it made me recall in my late teenage years, we had this uh, practice that we'd go out on a Friday night, actually, street preaching. I don't know if those of you who are older remember any of that, but uh, we'd have a, a trailer just open without sides and uh, we'd have a, a band and, and um, half a dozen, a dozen singers on this trailer and we used to sing in Melbourne. Uh, so this is another form of outreach anyway. So that's what you do with it. Put the bumper on bumper sticker on your bumper bar and it can remind Jesus of, uh, remind us and the community of Jesus and um, what he's done for us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, John. I have a question for you. Do you know what week is it today? This week, sorry. What? Health week. Very good. So <clears throat> it looks like Mr. Dorp is back in town. Uh, <laughs> I would like to, to clarify something. Some, some people came to me, they thought that Dorp was a person, but that's not it. That's a program. That's our church runs for a while. Uh, uh, I've met the, the Dorp. So very interesting. So I will ask Michael and Carmen to, to come forward. Well, one, two, one, two, one, two. We promised, uh, we promised last Sabbath that we're going to have some presents. For those actually who took part in the challenge. The so challenge. The challenge. What's the challenge? What was the challenge? Mm, how many people um, uh, send their... Oh, let me check, let me check. I've got <laughs> a steps. list here with people that send their, their steps. Um, all right, all right. Um, can I see some hands up? <laughs> Who took the challenge? <laughs> oh, no, 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 it was meant to send me a message, sorry. Yeah, well... Johnny, we announced the winner today, is it right? Yes, and it looks like Katrina <laughs> took part in that as well. Did you send us the number? That's okay. That's, That's all right. We've good. got plenty of presents here, okay. right? <laughs> We've yes, got plenty so of presents. Johnny very faithfully send us the number with the steps. So, so Johnny, come, come in the front. We have a gift for you. Pick up your, your you present. <laughs> oh, it's a serious one, all right? <laughs> it's a good one. I hope you didn't think we were joking. <laughs> so last That's time when we come up one. with a challenge, last time it's it's a very, very good book. So This is yeah. an incentive for when we announce a challenge next time, Please take part in it. It's take not, it seriously. It's fun, and you benefit from it as well. And yeah, it's really good. So, Katrina. Yes. All right, come okay. come forward. That's okay. All Katrina, right, we've got a present for you too here. A wonderful book. Wonderful book. And I think I think I saw one more hand here. Who, who was it? Was it Kim? Oh, I think Kim. No, who was it? No. All right. Oh, what am I going to do? I'll take all these presents home. That's okay. We don't have much time, honey, so we have to condense all the information. So uh, what happened on Thursday night? Yes, on Thursday night we had uh, dinner. Who? That was good. But why? Ah, all right. I forgot to say. <laughs> we had the graduation ceremony for all the people that went through our Forgive to Leave program. And um, probably you'll see some pictures on on know, Facebook. Yeah. We don't have them here, uh, but yeah, it was it but was what quite... a blessing it was. It was really good, and uh, to see you know people sharing. And I don't know, Jeremy, if I can put you on the spot. <laughs> what was it like for you to go through the program? Yeah, come, come, come at the quickly. front. Or oh, Kimmy, both of you, you can come because I think this is. This is the best way yeah. for people to know what the program does for people. I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the times when programs get announced in church, I hear it and I go, that's for somebody else. I don't know, if you put your, don't need to put your hand up because that would have been me. 
Um, look, when Forgive to Live came up, uh, Kim, we have Bible studies every Tuesday night, Revelation Bible studies, and that was my excuse not to do Forgive to Live. And then obviously Kim said, oh, no, I'm doing it. But she's my Bible study buddy. So wherever my wife goes, I go. Dangerous thing to say, yeah? Um, but ultimately we did get involved and, you know, um, I did share, and Corinne actually mentioned that it was unusual for a Mauritian Rodriguez man to share as deeply as I did on Thursday night. But I think um, that's just who I am. I'm an open book. So sometimes I'll say things and people go, did Jeremy just say that? Yes, I did. I did just say that. But ultimately, one just to condense it, one of the things that I am or have been all my life is an angry man. Um, I have a temper. I have issues even standing in lines. You put me in a line somewhere, um, and like, I'll give you an example, I was at Officeworks one day, and I was in a line waiting, I had to go back to the factory, and there was two people at the desk, one of them wasn't serving. I was waiting, there was about 20 people in front of me, I waited, waited, and in my mind I'm thinking, do your job, do your job. And then finally, I could not long, no longer stand it anymore, I said, hey mate, you wanna serve some people soon, please? Turns out he was the manager of the store, okay? Um, but he was so embarrassed that he did serve everybody. Um, now we're good mates. But the point is, I'm saying is that I'm also the sort of person that will chase someone to Phillip Island if they cut me off in traffic. Um, and so this is a problem that I've had for a long time. I've had temper issues, I have anger issues. And the bizarre thing about my temper and anger issues is it's directed at people I don't know. People I know, like church members, family, don't even know sometimes that I have a temper, unless you've crossed me sometimes, that can happen. But the point is, it's usually from people I don't know, which is even more bizarre, because there's no connection there. But it's as though I kept into a high stand. And through the program, I found out through Dr. Tibbetts that some of that has to do with pride. Uh, I think I'm better than them. I think that uh, I know more than them. And I hold them to the standard that I should hold, that I hold myself to. And so there was a lot of humbling experiences. In fact, uh, there was one particular program that I, we took and I didn't expect it to impact me so much, but I was quite emotional after the, the, the series because I realized that I had been that person that was not prepared to give people a second chance. I was that person that would, you cross me once, that's it, you're gone. And that's not what God wants us to be. So I would challenge you and I know I won't tell you who I know in church is like that because I know there are people in church that are like that. Some might be related to me, I don't know. Um, but my point is here, if that is your problem, if that's an issue that you have, give it over to Jesus. And I will tell you that now I am doing a lot of woo in the car. I'm not following people of Phillip Island. I am letting things go a lot more and I'm willing to forgive people, and I would say I thank the Forgive to Live program. Yeah. Um, I felt impressed when they, Carl and Michael, were advertising it. I felt impressed to want to sign up and join in, and I didn't have in me that Jeremy would join me because I, for him to commit time to things is really a struggle because he has such a busy schedule already, but I thought... Even if he doesn't, I'm still going to do it. And I found it was a huge blessing for me. God has taught me a lot about love and forgiveness already. But just recognising some of um, what they've found out through scientific study and clinical studies on the effects of holding on to uh, grievance and um, frustration against people, what it does to your own health and how you can heal your mind and have a better peace, God's peace in you by um, using these techniques. And I, I really think that it's a benefit to everyone to take part in this program if you haven't already. And as they were telling us, you can redo it anytime. And I think it's really cool to connect with other people who are going on that same journey too. Thank you. Thanks, Kimmy. We are mindful that we've taken quite a fair bit of time, honey. So Pro Probably just before we yeah. go to the next item, uh, we want to say a big thank you to Sylvia. Sylvia Wan, uh, she's been the, the engine behind all this and it's just amazing to see the excitement, the enthusiasm that she has. And it's very 
contagious. So uh, all those participants that they want to help in the future with the program, please let us know and we'll include you in the program next time. Yes. And probably just a few more uh, words about the DAC. Why we were here initially. So, which is depression anxiety recovery program. So, we are just about to start that program. Our first information session is on the 5th of um, June, which will be face to face at Heritage. And uh, on the 7th, we have online uh, information session. Um, this program is not for people, only for people who experience depression anxiety, it's for anyone anyone it equips you with um skills to deal better with stress and tell me is anyone here who doesn't experience stress okay katrina doesn't so that's good so you don't need that program <laughs> but i'm telling you a lot of people these days face a lot of stress so this program is designed to give you the, the skills and um you know the knowledge to deal better with uh, with stress so we are looking forward to see you if you want more information please come and talk to us we put the link in the bulletin and um, yeah in text message as well thank you thank you <clears throat> Ah, oh, really? <laughs> uh, we're running out of time. Uh, we just have two more minutes for Give More. For a promotion, isn't it? Good morning, church, and every Sabbath. I've got a book here, but I'm not giving it away. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, just a quick announcement. Who wants a happy home? Just raise up your hand if you want a happy home. Great. Everyone wants a happy home. And... Um, We've got the Bible, it's our guideline for a happy home, but we also have got a fantastic book which helps us to guide us through on how to have a happy home. It's called The Adventist Home. I know in, in everyone's house, in, in our bookshelves, we have got this book, Happy Home, Adventist Home. Maybe it's been a long time since we last read it. So on behalf of the family life, we're just encouraging everyone just to give it a go. Just one topic every one topic every week will do. It will change our life. It touches all the aspects of family, be it marriages, be it uh, raising the children, be it dating for the young adults, be it stewardship and everything. So as a church, we are encouraging you this year to get a copy of this book, read it, and family life will be praying for you and will be in, will be actually organizing some book reviews that you can share what you are reading. May God bless you. Right. So, Pastor, just let me know that we have another building update. So, we'll watch this before we sing the first song.
I invite you all to I invite you all to stand as we sing how great thou art. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the work thy hand has made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! And through the blue. And forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain wonder, and hear the moon, and feel a gentle breeze, then sings my soul. My Morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, it is now time for the main prayer, so I ask you all to take a reverent position. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this day to be with you and to worship you and to be around fellow people like us, O oh Lord. We thank you for waking up, for waking us up this morning. As 
Sometimes we may forget that we may set an alarm before bed, thinking that that is what wakes us up in the morning when you are the one who decides that we get to live another day, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the church building progress and the pro the church building project and the progress that has been made and the funds that have been coming in and the funds that are to come. We also pray that you be with those who are involved in many different aspects. Lord, we pray for Therese and Mark as they are sick with COVID. Oh Lord, may you please be with them and protect them. And Lord, we ask for, your heal for you to place your healing hand on Margaret as she, has, as she is healing from a successful procedure procedure that she underwent on Thursday. Additionally, may you please place your hand on all those who are sick and unwell. In a world where beliefs and morals are rapidly changing, we ask that you be with us wherever we go and in whatever we do. Lastly, Lord, we ask that you be with Dr. Alex Roman as he's going to be preaching here today. We ask that you speak through him and into us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, now it's time to worship our Lord with our tithes and offering. Uh, for those visiting, visiting us, I just want to let you know about the, we have two bugs. So the red one is for the tithe and the blue one is for the building fund. And I can, I can tell you something about the building. We perhaps, we, we seeing videos every, every week or every two weeks, but we, we can't really understand really what's happening when you're there that you really see the works that's going in. And uh, I can tell you something, uh, I've been there quite, quite often, not as often as I wish, have wished, but I can tell you something, the, I can see the end of the tunnel. So keep on praying, keep on giving, and keep on helping. We, we are nearly there. Okay, the building for the blue bag is a building fund. And then the offering today is going to the health department for the Southern Pacific Division. Uh, let's say a word of prayer before I ask the deacon to go through there. Dear Jesus, we, we thank you, Lord, that you've blessed us during this week. Lord, you provided for each one of us and at this time, we bring our offerings and our tithes, Lord. Dear Jesus, thank you for the strength, for the health that you give us, and we're returning, Lord, what you gave already to us. Dear Jesus, give us a generous heart, and we pray for all those that are going to uh, manage this money, give them the wisdom, and may, Lord, your work may progress all around the world. Dear Jesus, Bless each one of us here. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. And the best part of the program uh, is happening now. Where are my children? Where are my children? <laughs> all right, all right, amazing. I want to see more children coming. I know we haven't finished the offering, but I just can't, can't wait 
It's just too good. <laughs> the children's story is fun, no, not only for children, but for whoever tells the story, all right? So, all right, all the children. Can I have all the children come and look at that? Ooh, that's amazing. Well done, guys. I'm so happy to see you at church this morning. You're happy to be here? Are you happy to be at church? Yes, to meet your friends. How great is that? To go to the Samba school, that's amazing. All right, so what I want this morning, I want to invite you to let your imagination go wild a little bit. So let's go to our first, uh, first slide there. So I want you, first slide, thank you. I want you to imagine that you have a country house. You're living with your mom and dad and your siblings in a, in a beautiful country house, all right? It's everything, it's just green and flowers. And not only that, but not far away from the house, you have a, a lake, all right? It's a good, good size lake. So can you, can you picture yourself in your mind you're already there, just the birds are chirping, and, and maybe you have a couple of pets there, I don't know. Can you, can you imagine that? All right, so let's say it's a beautiful day, sunshine outside. You're in the house, and it happened that you're in the kitchen. And you remember that mom has a cookie jar somewhere at the top shelf. Ooh, would you like a cookie? Do you like cookies? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. You haven't had a cookie before. You, you had. All right. He had a cookie before. He knows that. So there is a cookie jar in the kitchen just out of reach. So it's right on the top shelf there. And you're thinking, ah. Oh, at least one cookie jar, I just want to, so you make a plan. So you bring a chair, you climb on the chair. All right, so let's just do some exercise now. Can you, can you do it with me? All right, get up. We'll do it together. We'll do it together. All right. Ah, this is getting exciting. All right, so... You're reaching up, up. Can you reach? Can you reach? No, no, no. I, it's, it's a little bit high. Just, ah, oh, no, no, no. The other hand, maybe the other hand is longer. Ah, oh, reach. <gasps> Wait. I can hear something, someone coming. <gasps> I think that's my mom. Get off the chair quickly and run. Run outside. Run outside. Run. Guys, I want you to run, right? You run. Run outside. Go to the lake. Run, run down to the lake. All right. There, at the lake, oh, you're lucky. There is a boat there. So you hop in the boat. You hop in the boat. All right. You take the rows and you start rowing to cross on the other side. Rowing. All right, guys. Rowing hard. All right. More, more, more. Come on, come on, come on. You'll, you'll be caught very soon if you don't row fast. All right. Ooh, ah. How do you feel? Come on, Jaden. Do some rowing there. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Now, now you get on the other side of the lake and you just found the bike, the BMX that you left the previous day there. Ah, oh, my bike here. Get on the bike, hop on the bike, hop on the bike and all right, let's just do some pedals now on the bike. And quick, 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 come on, on the bike. You like biking, all right? Come on. <laughs> Oh, wait, wait a moment. I never saw this here, but there is a cave. I never saw this cave here. Ooh, what if we go in the cave? It's a bit dark. We don't have a torch. You don't want to go in the cave? Or just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit there because you don't have a torch, all right? And you don't want to, you never know, but you go, your eyes are just in, adjusting a little bit to the, to the dark there. And you see, wow, there was a cave. Where was this cave before? <gasps> All of a sudden, you see two eyes. What do you do? You turn around and you run, 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 run. You go to the bicycle, take the bicycle, 
quick, 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 take the bicycle, go to the water, go to the water, you get to in the boat, you row back, row back, row back, row back, come on, come on, row back, There's, there are two eyes there in the cave, it's following you, all right, and then you get back on the other side and run to the house, go inside, oh, I'm so exhausted, Whew. let me just have a rest on the couch, Whew. how was that? Oh, a little bit of exercise. Well, we have Dr. Alex with us this morning, and he is going to talk to us about health. And physical exercise is one of them. And you remember, mom and dad had a challenge. They used to, they should have, this week, all right, about walking 10,000 steps. So I think we've done like a 1,000 now. That's how I feel it. But anyway, let's go to the next verse. Next slide. And Peter said, you remember Peter, one of Jesus' disciples? I don't have any silver or gold, but I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ from Nazareth, get up and start walking. So it's interesting that when Jesus healed people, he said, get up and walk. And Peter says the same, and probably everyone said the same. They, they didn't say, oh, now you're healed, just wait here for the ambulance to come, to take you home. All right? He said, get up, get up and walk. And Jesus walked all his life. He didn't have even a bicycle. All right? He walked a lot. So walking, we know that is very, very healthy for you guys. All right? Riding a bike is very, very good for you. So uh, grab your dad or mom, go for a walk to the park, uh, go uh, for a ride with a bicycle. This is so, so good. All right, so uh, that was the health, the health um, story this morning. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And now I want to invite uh, the, the person that is doing the... Oh, Jaden. Oh, you're doing the, the scripture reading. Jaden and uh, Roxanne. All right, thank you very much, guys. You can go back to your seats. All right, all right. Happy Sabbath, Church. Our scripture reading for today comes from 3 John 1, verse 1 to 2. From an elder to my dear Gaius, whom I love, truly love, my dear friend, I pray that everything may go well with you and that you may be in good health, as I know you are well in spirit. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, my name's Alex. I'm um, very happy to be here this morning. Thank you for welcoming me in your church. Um, if we could just start with just a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here today in this, um, this wonderful church. Thank you, Lord, that we are at a time in which we can come together. And for those of us that are here and are well, we thank you for that blessing. Please, Lord, come in amongst us, speak through me, speak to me, and help this message to be delivered among your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Absence sharpens love, patience strengthens it. All things are difficult before they are easy. Health is not valued until sickness comes. These are the words of uh, 17th century Christian Thomas Fuller. So in keeping with Health Week, I'd just like to start by exploring just a few select areas of what may be important to us, both as Christians and as physical beings. As Adventists, we have had more exposure to health-related literature than other denominations. 
is this literature still relevant to us, to you and I today? Most of this talk will actually stem from the writings of Ellen White. If we were to define health or the abundance of life, how are we to go about doing this? The definition would need to be an encompassing one. Health is a state of complete physical, social, and mental well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. A person said to enjoy good health when they're free of physical ailments, of mental stress, and enjoys good interpersonal relationships. In the past several decades, the definition of health and the determinants of health have developed themselves quite a lot. Although before this, it was linked to the physical well-being of only just the one person, but now it refers more to the situation where a person is enjoying good mental health, is awakened spiritually, and has a good and abundant social life. Health is thus a level of functional efficiency and a general condition of a person's mind, body, and spirit. It's a resource of everyday life and a positive concept emphasizing our human capabilities. This includes creating healthy communities, including our friends and our family, learning to communicate in ways that enhance the intimacy with our loved ones, developing empathy and love for ourselves and others, and developing a spiritual connection with God that brings comfort, strength, and joy in life. To break it down, you need to have quite a concentrated effort in order to achieve this in its total fullness. Total health comes about by developing and balancing the physical, the mental, the social, and the spiritual components within your life. Spiritual health should overlay the other three. The indicators of the four main health components are, for the physical health, being physically fit, having a high energy reserve, being well nourished, having a healthy weight, being free of disease, and having a high resistance to disease. From the mental health point of view, to be happy, to have a positive outlook, someone who copes well with the ups and downs of life, motivated to achieve, has a good self-image, is interested in life and adaptable to change. They would share feelings that give and receive love, and there'd also be a sense of intellectual achievement. In social health, to harbor good relationships, someone that communicates really well, they get along easily with others, they value their community, they're supportive to family and friends, and they handle conflicts and problems well. And finally, with spiritual health, the inner peace, having that meaning of life, having a values-directed life, someone that can act as a mentor to others around them, someone who's responsive to the supreme being and aware of their inner strength. Each of these well-being components has a profound effect on the others. They're integrated and can't be separated out. Except, obviously, conceptually, so we can better understand how it all fits together. For example, the physical activity can contribute to a healthy weight, to a good self-image, to a high resistance to disease, an increased, an increased lifespan, with a greater opportunity to mentor and encourage others around us. For unhappy people or people suffering with depression, they may lose their appetite, have no energy to enjoy life. They're more susceptible to disease. They have a shorter lifespan. They can become disheartened and lose hope. Poor relationships can lead to hostility, isolation, loneliness, distress, decreased immunity, and have a greater risk of disease. On the other hand, good social interaction and support. This lengthens life. People with a deep spiritual connection will have purpose in life and have an inner drive and motivation to take good care of their health. Even modern day research shows that they handle stress and crisis better and they can live longer than those without commitment to spiritual development. Spirituality is the unifying force that brings together together the physical, 
mental, emotional, and social dimensions of life. Spirituality is the foundation that supports who and what one is. Paying total attention to all of the components of well-being for optimum lifelong health is vital. According to Ellen White, the work of health reform is the Lord's mean for lessening suffering in our world and for purifying his church. The Advent health message has the dual purpose of alleviating the suffering of the world and purifying the church for the second coming of Christ. Concerning the first purpose, God is interested not only in his church, but also in humankind. Lessening suffering means alleviating, mitigating, and solving to a certain point the disease burden and its consequences. Those who do not know the experience of salvation in Jesus or have never accepted entering into a dynamic relationship with him have not solved the mystery of sin and its consequences. The second purpose of the Advent health message is a positive message for purifying the church. When Christians see and feel in their bodies and minds the rewards of living in harmony with the natural laws of God, they understand the blessings of living in harmony with the moral law of God through the power of Jesus who transforms their character. Ellen White explains that the body is the only medium through which the mind and the soul are developed for the upbringing of character. In fact, those who transgress the law of God in their physical organism will be inclined to violate the law of God spoken from Sinai. In order to reach the highest standard of moral and intellectual attainments, it's necessary to seek wisdom and strength from God to observe the strict temperance in all habits of life. The abundant living promised by Jesus in John 10 verse 10 has also had for full, a full fulfillment through the acceptance and practice of the blessing of the health message. Only Jesus gives people eternal life and adds quality and quantity of life now to them through living a healthy lifestyle. Only those who have been transformed by God's grace and have been empowered by his spirit are capable of living a lifestyle in harmony with his natural and moral laws. The great contribution of Ellen White was the organization of this health message in the definition, the nature, the purpose, the contents, and the application of these principles and practices to the times in which they were written. Remember, Ellen White's lifespan had been from 1827 to 1915. The application to the then modern world and the promotion of this material was not in keeping with the practices of the time. However, it had been assessed in the light of the principles and practices of the Bible. For instance, there's nothing in the Bible about cigarettes or smoking or about exercise or being sedentary. And Ellen White condemned cigarettes at the time in which there was a boom in the tobacco industry between 1870 and 1880 in the US. At that time, smoking was used even as a remedy for treating pain and other diseases. And this was in London, in European countries and in the US. And unfortunately, there had been a promotion of cigarettes through even doctors at the time. And some of these have remained with us as photo evidence. Another extension of this application is through the increasingly sedentary lifestyle, as this had never been a problem in previous times or in biblical times because people were highly active on a daily basis. She advocated for preserving and promoting active exercise among the development of technology and the concentration of the population in the big cities. In 2014, Non-communicable diseases accounted for the deaths of 27 million people per year around the world. So this had been mainly through cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. And in 2014, the World Health Organization predicted that the total death number would rise from 27 million to 38 million by the year 2030. That's still eight years away. And that was a prediction of 38 million. Do you know how many died of non-communicable diseases just last year? So in 2021, the non-communicable disease accounted for 41 million deaths. That's equivalent to 71% of deaths globally. So the heart and the cardiovascular diseases accounted for most deaths, that was about 17 million, followed by cancers at 
and respiratory diseases at 4.1 and diabetes at 1.5. And these four groups of diseases account for over 80% of all premature deaths. So these are rising rapidly, much faster than what the prediction rates have been. And World Health Organization advises that tobacco use, physical inactivity, the harmful use of alcohol, and unhealthy diets all increase the risk of dying from a non-communicable disease. Through the passages of the New Testament, we can observe that Jesus valued physical health. Matthew 5 also holds strong evidence for this. Healing people physically was a big part of what Jesus did. When the synagogue, name, uh, uh, when the synagogue leader named Jairus came to Jesus, fell at Jesus' feet, and begged Jesus to come and lay hands on his daughter so that she may be made well. Jesus didn't hesitate to go with him. Jesus' healing wasn't just incidental or accidental, as if he had no choice. Healing wasn't something that Jesus did haphazardly or because he was cornered or forced to do it. Jesus healed people's bodies because he cared about their suffering and anguish. In the case of the woman who touched his cloak, Jesus took the time to find and talk to the woman because he wanted to restore life and offer relief. By affirming what she had done, Jesus verified that the healing in which had occurred was not something stolen against his will. By commending her faith, Jesus assured her and us that it was his goal and desire to bring physical healing. In his great compassion, he always lifted the broken spirit combining the spiritual so that their recovery may be complete. So closely is health related to our happiness that we cannot have the latter without the former. A practical knowledge of the science of human life is necessary in order to glorify God in our bodies. Helen White likens navigating life without the understanding of the structure and function of our own bodies and of nature's laws to drifting about like a ship out at sea without a compass or an anchor. She urges us to keep our bodies in a healthy condition and prevent disease. It's our duty to study the laws that govern our being and conform to them. Ignorance in these things would be considered a sin. Physical life cannot be treated in a careless manner. Awaken to your responsibilities. Through our reason, the human mind should become receptive in regard to the physical structure. We behold and admire the work of God in the natural world, but the human habitation is the most wonderful. To become acquainted with the human organism, the bones, the muscles, the stomach, the liver, the bowels, the heart, the skin, and to understand the dependence of one organ upon the other for the healthful act of all. Through reason, through, from cause to its effect, people can follow the light which shines for all to pursue a course that would lead to better outcomes, to a time with lower mortality rates. Ellen White writes that the ignorance of physiology and the neglect to observe the laws of health have brought many to the grave who have lived to labor and study intelligently, an unnecessarily shortened end. The current stats in Australia right now one in, uh, sorry, seven in 10, which is most Australian men are overweight or obese. One in two of Australian women are overweight or obese, and one in four children are overweight or obese. It's 25% and it's a rising figure of our children who are metabolically ill. This can only set them up for a life of early onset chronic disease, both mentally and physically. Our country, along with America, has the highest adult obesity prevalence of high-income countries. A 2020 study on mortality trends in Australia and the USA identified that recent increases in cardiovascular mortality associated with one or more chronic diseases, which include diabetes, kidney disease, obesity, cholesterol issues, or high blood pressure, and had a higher lifetime presence of obesity in the younger age groups then this has been quite an alarming finding. Each country's mortality rate in these associated conditions rose by 3% just in the last year. 
as well as having larger increases in mortality rates at successively younger ages. And this was strongly related to the obesity rates in younger people, which is likely to impact the future life expectancy rates very soon. A Danish study in 2020 had shown children that we are as young as six has started to show abnormal liver enzymes in overweight and obese children. And these are biochemical markers of liver stress and cellular damage. These are children as young as six. Another review article on obesity highlighted a few key factors. So that this is spread like a pandemic, that the visceral fat plays a role in metabolic function and alterations to practically all body systems. And that the poor nutrition is represented by the typical food of the Western diet. So exploration into our Western diet uncovers a majority of processed and what's now known as highly processed food or ultra processed, depending on what you read. And these are typically rapidly absorbed. They're highly refined carbohydrates and fat. These foods have a higher addictive potential than typically high fat only foods through their ability to spike blood glucose levels rapidly. These highly processed foods in a similar way to addictive substances, are more effective in activating a reward-related neural system compared to you know, minimally processed foods. And more importantly, highly processed foods are associated with the behavioral indicators of addiction. And this can look like a weakened control over your consumption amount, strong cravings, continued use despite the negative consequences, and repeated and failed attempts to reduce or eliminate their intake. We are not on our own. We have been purchased with a dear price through the suffering and death of Jesus. Has Jesus given himself for us? Has a dear price been paid to redeem us? If we could understand this and fully realize it, we'd feel a great responsibility resting upon us to keep ourselves in the very best condition of health, that we may render to God perfect service. Let's honor him also through our vitality, strength, and intellect. We're given a short list of areas to focus on through Ellen White. One is fresh air, two is sunlight, three is pure water, four is exercise, Five is a proper diet. Six is periodic rest. Seven is temperance. And eight is trust in and thankfulness to our Creator. And where does God fit into this issue of disease? Are there illnesses brought upon the earth and onto the human race through God's providence? No, they exist because the people have gone contrary to His providence and still continue to disregard His laws. Romans 12 encourages us to render to God the best service we are capable of. I therefore urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer you as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that that is good and acceptable and perfect to the will of God. We stand to gain nothing by violating the principles of the laws of health. The history of Daniel is placed upon record for our benefit. He chose to take a course that would make him singled out in the king's court. He didn't conform to the habits of the courtiers in eating and drinking, but proposed in his heart that he would not eat of the king's meat or of his wines. And this was not you know, a hastily formed wavering purpose, but one that was intelligently formed and determined and carried out Daniel honored God, and the promise was fulfilled to him. Them that honor me, I will honor. The Lord gave him knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And he had understanding in all visions and dreams, so that he was wiser than all in the king's courts and in the kingdom. We're in a world that is opposed to righteousness and opposed to the purity of character and the growth in grace. Wherever we look, we see corruption and defilement, deformity and sin. 
Our work here includes preserving our bodies holy, our spirits pure, so that we may stand forth unstained amid the corruptions teeming around us in these last days. And if this work is accomplished, we need to engage in it at once, cheerfully and with purpose. If we have a right hold on heaven, a right hold of the power that is from above, we shall feel the sanctifying influence of the Spirit of God upon our hearts. And when we have spoken to our friends and families, presenting the health message, and have spoken to them of the importance of eating and drinking and doing all that they do for the glory of God, many by their actions have said, look, it's no one's business whether I eat this or that. Whatever we do, you know, I'm going to bear the consequences myself. Ellen White cautions us that we not only suffer our own consequences, but the people around us suffer with us too. If we suffer from poor self-control in eating or drinking, others around us are also affected. If this has enough influence to lessen your powers of body and mind, will we be in a position to help others? Will we be so numbed by our wrong course of living that we cannot give the right counsel? Ellen White poses the question, do we not meet with a loss? The health reform is an important part of the third angel's message. And as a people professing this reform, we should strive for continual advancement. It's a great thing to ensure health by placing ourselves in right relations to the laws of life. And many of us have not done this. White reminds us that a large share of the sickness and suffering amongst us is the result of our own transgression of the physical law, which is brought upon individuals by their own individual wrong habits. Our ancestors have passed us customs and appetites, which are filling the world with disease as well. The bad eating of many generations, the gluttonous and self-indulgent habits of the people, these are reflected in the amount of preventable lifestyle-related chronic diseases that are accelerating at an alarming pace. Ellen White mentions that those who serve God in sincerity and truth, they will be a peculiar people, unlike the world, separate from the world. Their food will be prepared not to encourage gluttony or to gratify a perverted taste, but to secure themselves the greatest physical strength and consequently the best mental conditions. Our faith requires us to elevate the standard of reform and take advancing steps. The Lord calls upon us as a people. Come out from among them and be ye separate, and I will receive you. The God of heaven promises to receive you and to be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, said the God Almighty. We are urged to understand the importance of maintaining the health of the body and to remember that gluttony is a sin and it will eventually affect your spirituality. A close association exists between the physical and moral nature. The standard of virtue is eventually elevated or degraded by our physical habits. Any habit which does not promote healthful action in the human system degrades the higher or the noble faculties. Wrong habits of eating and drinking leads to error in thought and action. Indulgences of appetites and physical wants strengthen the carnal tendencies, giving them dominance over logic sometimes, over our mental and spiritual powers. In Apostles Peter's words, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Many regard this warning as applicable only to the immoral, but it has a broader meaning. It guards against every harmful gratification of appetite or passion. It's interesting to note that Ellen White associates this statement with her warning against the use of stimulants and narcotics. She mentions specifically tea, coffee, tobacco, alcohol, and morphine. These indulgences may well be classed among the lusts that exert a destructive influence upon moral character, she writes. The earlier these hurtful habits are formed, the more firmly they will hold their victims in slavery to desire, and the more certainly they will lower the standard of spirituality. Like Daniel, those who are truly sanctified will elevate the moral standard by preserving correct physical habits, presenting to others an example of temperance and self-denial. Everything that conflicts with natural law creates a disease condition of the soul. 
With what care should Christians regulate their habits, that they may preserve the full vigor of every faculty to give to the service of Christ? If we would be sanctified in soul, body, and spirit, we must live in conformity to the divine law. The heart cannot preserve consecration to God while the appetites and passions are indulged at the expense of health and life. Now, remember Ellen White was around from 1827 to 1915. And she does have a bit to say about the dangers of the free use of sugar in the regular diets. She mentions um, this in a chapter where it's combined with the overuse of milk. And in her words, sugar clogs the system. It hinders the workings of the living machine. And then she goes to describe the demise of a nobleman from Michigan who had been overeating sugar. She describes his case as he was a victim to poor cooking. He tries to make sugar take the place of good cooking, and it only made his matters worse. White reports that from the light given to her, sugar, when largely used, is more detrimental than meat. Now, in 1889, there were a, a, two gentlemen, Joseph von Mering and Oscar Minowski, that found out that by removing the pancreas from a dog, you could lead to the rapid development of diabetes and death shortly afterwards. And in 1936, there was a Sir Harold Percival Hemsworth who published research that founded our theories and the discovery and the exploration of type 2 diabetes. Now, one month ago, the University of Cambridge published the most comprehensive study in the middle age involving people with and without type 2 diabetes. And they found that people with type 2 diabetes carried a high risk of 57 other significant health conditions. These findings, which are now being presented at the Diabetes UK conference, the Professional Endocrinology Conference, um, show that having type 2 diabetes was linked to a 9% greater risk of cancer. It also showed that people with the condition are two times more likely to have end-stage kidney disease, four times more likely to have liver cancer, and two times more likely to have macular degeneration, which is an eye condition. And on average, those with the health conditions had these health problems as many as five years earlier than people without it. And this study focused on people over 30 years of age. And they found that the highest risk was found in those who had already received a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes before the age of 50. May I remind you that this is in the UK, a high-income, progressive nation whose people have access to health care. The rates of this disease increase as a nation's poverty rate increases. Living in poverty in two years prior to a diagnosis of diabetes, this increased your risk of development by 24%. And this risk was not altered after they factored in for weight or physical ability or disability. There's an unacceptable manifestation of poor health in middle-aged people with type 2 diabetes. And it's a stark reminder of the extensive and serious long-term effects on the body. Many people complain of providence because of the discomfort and inconvenience in which they suffer, when this is the sure result of their own action or inaction. They seem to feel that they are ill-treated of God when they themselves are alone responsible for the consequences which they endure. Our kind and merciful Heavenly Father has established laws which, when obeyed, would promote physical, mental, and moral health. A violation of these laws is a violation of the immutable law of God. And Ellen White mentions that a penalty sure will follow. God requires us to yield our own will to His. Many have experienced, uh, expected that God would keep them from sickness merely because they've asked him to do so. Ellen White advises that God will not work a miracle to keep those from sickness who have no care for themselves and are continually violating the laws of health and make no effort to prevent disease. When we do all we can on our part to have health, then we may, be, but then we may expect that the blessed results will follow. And we can ask God in faith to bless our efforts for the preservation of health. Let all that understand that they have a work to do. 
God will not work in a miraculous manner to preserve the health of persons who are taking a sure course to make themselves sick by their careless inattention to the laws of health. That's from the book of How to Live. And some other interesting points that I came across. And I find that Ellen White is really quite harsh in what she says. And it's not just the way that I'm kind of passing the information across. This is, this is how it is. From the Review and Herald in 88, God does not work miracles where he has provided means by which the work may be accomplished. Faith without intelligent works is dead, being alone. Faith in the healing power of God will not save unless it's combined with good works. The strong desire for recovery leads to earnest prayer, and this is right. God is our refuge in sickness and in health. Prayer will give the sick an abiding confidence. Jesus can limit the power of Satan. He is the physician in whom in the sin-sick soul may trust to heal the maladies of the body as well as the soul. So where do we begin again? So number one was fresh air. The poor quality air and air pollution are linked to many different types of diseases, heart attack, stroke, heart failure, asthma, COPD, cancer, premature mortality. Not only does a walk in nature benefit our lungs, but it is also associated with benefits to mental health, decreased depression and perceived stress, and improved well-being. Number two is sunlight. Apart from producing vitamin D in the skin, which is important for a variety of different bodily functions, low levels of vitamin D are linked to chronic disease, obesity, heart, stroke, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune issues. There's actually a study published that said that if your vitamin D level is under 20, that you basically doubled your chance of every, every disease. Sunlight is also important for our daily biological clock, our circadian rhythm. Now, there's a condition out there known as the winter blues. The formal name is called seasonal affective disorder. And this has been observed in people living in areas where winters have shorter days and longer nights. And it manifests as depression, sadness, and fatigue. And it goes away when summer comes back around. And being indoors all day and not getting enough sunlight can also predispose to this condition. Number three was water. The average adult female needs about two liters, and the average adult male needs about two and a half liters of clean water every day. The human body can last weeks without food, but only days without water. Number four was exercise. People who exercise enjoy a higher quality of life, improved health status, and lower hospital admissions compared to people who are sedentary. People who exercise regularly enjoy less chronic disease, less arthritis, less respiratory illness, less joint pain, better immunity, and interestingly, better thinking skills and memory. Physical inactivity has been ranked the fifth leading cause of disease burden in Western Europe. And it's more important than smoking. Obesity and high blood pressure leads above these things in terms of heart disease. So ideally what your exercise plan might look like is a 30 minute walk on most days of the week as well as resistance exercises. Think, you know, things like weight training, body weight exercises, or resistance bands, two to three times per week for optimal benefits. Ideally, two of these times should get you feeling quite hot and sweaty. Number five was a proper diet. There are these places in the world called blue zones, and there are five of them that we know of at the moment, where the people in which, um, reside there, they have the longest lifespans. So these are, um, you know, the Japanese have one in Okinawa, the Italians in Sardinia, the Costa Ricans in Nicoya, the Greeks in Ikaria, and the Seven Day Adventists in Loma Linda. And one of the common ingredients for each of these groups is a consumption of a largely whole food, plant-based diet rich in legumes, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, with very few or no animal foods. A basic knowledge of food composition is absolutely necessary. What's a protein? What's a carbohydrate? What's a fat? How do you break them down further? If you're still confused as to how to read the nutritional grid on the back of your store-bought foods, it's time for us to learn how to do this. Think about the things you put in your mouth 
and try to stay away from those which are highly processed. Number six is periodic rest. This rest includes avoiding overworking, adequate holiday time, proper relaxation and sufficient sleep. Sleep is important for the processing of information and experiences to form memories, to optimize your body metabolism and maintain your body weight. It has an important role in maintaining your immune system and mental health and reducing risk of chronic disease. We're not getting enough sleep in this fast paced world and the blue light at night contributes to this. Our body clock or our circadian rhythm is disrupted by our evolving devices, for example, light globes, TVs, computers, iPads, and mobile phones. You might have noticed that there's a, a blue light filter that's now available on them. The screen goes a little yellow to try and combat this. Our other conscripted rest is our rest in Jesus in the Sabbath, which is our way of, to remember our need of the Creator and to reconnect with Him, with family, and with others. Number seven is temperance. Temperance means to be self-disciplined, be abstinent or sober. The, de the desire for more and more is not only driving our stress up and affecting our mental and physical, but also destroying our planet. And the temperance includes the avoiding of eating more than our bodies require, as well as avoiding the wrong kinds of foods. Temperance, however, is more than diet and abstaining. It involves finding a balance in all our activities and behaviors, you know, that may be in themselves good in nature. But temperance is also about avoiding any harmful substance and, you know, making sure that even with the good things that we have some checks and balances for those as well. It's more comprehensive than just a diet. It includes time management in work, in ministry and exercise, in healthy living and every other activity. It's inclusive of food, but not limited to it. And number eight was trust in and thankfulness to our creator. The belief in the existence of a personal transcendental God who loves and cares about us and is responsive to our needs, a God that's in control and will ultimately work all things together for our good has positive effects on mental and physical health. Beliefs about where we came from, why we are here and where we are going give meaning to life and it can even remove anxiety about the future. The central theme is that we fully embrace God and not lose sight of the fact that the redemptive process of the gospel includes the whole person, body, mind, and soul. Does faith in God contribute to better relations with others and with oneself, therefore increasing the possibility of better health? Of course it does. Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. His heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterances of them. Nothing that in the way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There's no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Health is not valued until sickness comes, has been the quote I started with. I'll end with another really well-known one. If someone wishes for good health, one must first ask oneself if he's ready to do away with the reasons for his illness. Only then is it possible to help him. Amen. Uh, just one quick announcement before I leave. Um, unfortunately, it looks like um, the general Victorian healthcare system is ending up to have another um, bit of a crisis time. Uh, the rates of influenza have shot up in New South Wales and Queensland pretty dramatically over the last kind of three, four days. About one in five emergency presentations are currently due to flu-like symptoms. So just everyone, please be aware, have good hygiene practices and stay safe. Amen.
I invite you all to stand as we sing the closing hymn, Wonder of It All. There's the wonder of sunset at evening. But the wonder of wonder that fills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. There's the wonder of springtime and of The wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that so begun. Oh, the wonder of it all, the, the wonder of it all, just to dream that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you today in your place of worship to thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for life, for strength, for health. Thank you for our loving families and our supportive communities and churches. May you bless us and bless all the people around us. Lord, heal our sick, heal our afflicted, heal our tormented. Help us, Lord, to develop ways in which we can look after ourselves better and look after our friends and family in our communities better. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.